Welcome everyone to Every Nation Hatfield. My name is Wesley Brits, and I have the privilege of leading this congregation. Um, what an interesting start to our year, but I really trust that you are full of faith and still expecting to see what God is going to do in 2021. Um, we've already kicked off our Awesome God series, and this is a series where we as a, as a people gain a deeper understanding about exactly who God is, so that this can lead us to a lifestyle of worship, of holiness, and of mission. That is the whole purpose of this series. And over the next six weeks, we're going to look at men and women that had certain encounters with God. And this left them transformed as a title or a different name of God is introduced to us. This evening, we're looking at Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, my peace. And I'm so excited to share this message with you. And I'm going to pray and we get started. Lord, I just thank you for the time we have together, Lord. I know it's online, Lord, but thank you that you still move online, Lord, that you still have designated appointments with each one of us, even if it's through a screen yet tonight. Lord, I pray that exactly, Lord, what we hope will happen, Lord, that this would propel us into a lifestyle of worship, a lifestyle of holiness and a lifestyle of mission so that your kingdom can advance in our lifetime. Lord, this is for you to be heard and for you to be seen, for you to be worshipped. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, so tonight we're looking at the book of Judges. Now, this is a very interesting book. Um, it's a little bit disturbing on the one side because it's pretty much a book of war and a lot of suffering. Now, the name Judges actually could be a bit misleading. When we hear Judges, we kind of hear like um, something in, in a courtroom or we think of um, law or attorneys, but this is actually not the right understanding. It's more like Judges in the setting actually means something like military leaders or tribal chiefs. Now, where this book actually plays a part is Joshua had just led the nation of Israel into the promised land. Big victory for the nation. Everyone's happy. Land of milk and honey. Here we go. And then Joshua dies. And now the people don't really know what to do because their great leader has passed away. So what now? So now the nation decides, okay, we're going to... We're going to appoint, or God's going to appoint, um, certain military leaders that will help us overcome and drive out enemies in this new land. But what this book shows us is actually the moral decay of the nation of Israel. Where, as long as this book continues, the more Israel starts looking more like the pagan tribes around them, and not like the nation that God had actually ordained to be him, to be for Himself. And when studying this book, it's actually fascinating. You see a cycle repeating itself. You see people sin. Then God lets them over to their own desires. That leads them into slavery. Then the people remember, oh no, but wait a minute. We, we serve a God. They cry out to Him. They repent to Him. God is faithful and brings restoration and delivers them again. And then the cycle repeats itself. And this is so interesting as we pick up um, just in verse 21, uh, uh, Judges 21 verse 25, and the whole book can actually be summarized by this one scripture. And it says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So what once was this godly nation, everyone's just doing as they please. And there's absolute chaos in most parts of this book. In chapter 6 we find a man called Gideon. Now... What I love about Gideon, um, well, I love Gideon as well, but we're talking about Gideon today, is that Gideon is not a hero. There's nothing fancy about him. He's not this charismatic guy. He's actually, um, he's not a hero. Let me, let me let's keep it at that. Um, and if you had to appoint someone to kind of help or save you or get you out of trouble or to lead you into battle, Gideon would have most probably been the last name on everybody's list back in those days. Gideon was part of a small tribe, um, not a very affluent tribe as well. So this man, not much going on. But not only that, as you study this book and as you read more about him, you actually realize that Gideon is a deeply flawed, hum flawed human being. He's got a lot of faults and a lot of errors. He makes a lot of mistakes. He's, his faith isn't where you would want your leader's faith to be. And what I like about this is because Gideon's just so relate, re relatable in that manner because he's not this man on a pedestal that God chose to go and fight his battles. No, he's just a flawed human being that made himself available so that God could use him mightily. And in chapter 6, we find the story, and we, we're preaching from uh, verse 11 to 24 tonight. 
And the story actually starts, we, we look at Gideon and we find him in two different spots or we find Gideon having two different attitudes. In verse 11, we find this man scared, afraid and in hiding. And then verse 24, we find the same man, the same fearful, scared person worshiping God and saying yes to an incredible adventure God had installed for him. Now, my question is, what happened? How do we move from the coward Gideon to the champion Gideon? That's what we're going to look at tonight. So after 40 years of peace, um, there was a previous judge who led uh, Israel to victory. And um, 40 years of peace and everything's going well. And in that period, Israel do what most of us do when things are going well. We forget about God. We bench God we, uh, because everything's going well. I don't need God. And after 40 years of peace, Israel just keeps sinning and sinning. And God lets them over to their desires. And what that entailed is there was a tribe called the Midianites who took over and oppressed Israel. So we pick up the story where Israel is in oppression. And it's going so bad that the nation actually has to flee. Um, they're in hiding, they're living in caves, they're living in, in, in far off remote places in the desert. Um, things aren't going great for them at the moment. And we pick up the story at verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terabith at Oprah, which belonged to Joas the Abizarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Okay, so what's happening? Why is this written there? Friends, normally when there's something that you don't quite understand, um, everything in the Bible is intentional. So you should just say, okay, well, what's happening here? So let's do that. Why is it important for us to know that Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press? Well, firstly, wheat. What is wheat? Koran, koro. Okay. Wheat is, we all know what it is. You make bread with it. Okay. So when you had to um, press out or beat out wheat, it's because there were some other shrubs that have grown with it. So you need to separate the koring from the kafska in Afrikaans. Um, so you have to get rid of the, uh, the bad stuff so that you can hold to the good stuff. And to do something like that, you need a big area, a big space. So normally you do it in a barn. Uh, I presume in those days they did it in a big open field so that they could make sure they're getting the good stuff. And here we find Gideon doing it in a wine press. Now what's a wine press? You can quickly look at your screen. Here's a photo of a wine press. So what is a wine press? It's where you press grapes to make wine. Okay, so it's a big hole in the ground. So Gideon wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was scared for his life. He was fearful that the Midianites would do a raid and steal all his wheat. So therefore he went into a wine press and actually did it there. Gideon the coward, uh, afraid to be seen and just fearing for his life. See, this is as strange as it in modern day, like if you would make a fire out of wood and brine inside your house. Now, why would you do that? Well, um, because you probably don't want to be seen outside. So this is as strange as what it can be. Um, so when the early listeners heard this, they were like, oh, whoa, what's going on here? So this immediately brought attention to the next few verses. Verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all these wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. So the first thing that's interesting here is that the angel says to Gideon, O mighty man of valor. Now why does he say that? That doesn't make sense. That's not the picture. That's not the Gideon we're being introduced to. Why would the angel call him something he is clearly not? The angel of the Lord is calling out of Gideon what God intends to do in him despite the fear in his life. Friends, how awesome is our God that he, when he looks at us, he doesn't look into our flaws. He doesn't look into our, our shortcomings, but he sees something different. And for us that are in Christ, he sees Christ within us and therefore calls greatness out of him. And this is what's happening in this way. But friends, how many of us live in a way that what's happening around us determines more who we are than what God says? How many of us live in a way that, okay, it's locked down. So now this, this means this is how I'm going to live. This is how lockdown's changing who I am. Instead of listening to the voice of God and hearing who he says you and I are. 
Friends, I believe this is one of our biggest things that we have to stand up in this year and still make sure that God is defining us and not lockdown, not COVID, not economic tension, not polit political tension, not racial tension. All these outside factors cannot define and determine who we are. That right is alone God's. And friends, therefore, we have to consistently come back and say, Lord, help me to know you so that I can know who I am. Don't sell yourself short for what God can do in you and through you in this season. It's locked down, so I'm at home. I can't, I can't speak to people. I can't tell people about Christ. I can't be a light in the darkness. No, I have to be at home. No, friends, let's not sell ourselves short. For what God still wants to do is the same thing he wanted to do last year, the year before, in 10 years' time, 100 years ago. He wants to advance his kingdom. And we have the privilege and partnering of that. What I love about this is Gideon, the angel calls him a man of valor. Now that's kind of cool. Um, the angel says, I'm with you, of the Lord is with you, and you're a man of valor. What a cool moment. Can you just imagine an angel of the Lord saying, the Lord is with you, and you're a man of valor. I, for most of us, I could just see myself swelling up with pride and actually being excited. Wow, that's such a cool thing. But what's Gideon's response? He says, Okay, if the Lord is with me, why is this happening? Why, why are we in oppression? Why are, why, why, why? Doesn't that sound familiar? How many of us are currently asking, okay, but if God loves us and if God is here, why is this happening? Why is COVID? Why is lockdown? Why is this? Why is this? We love the question, why? And Gideon kind of overlooks just this compliment and this promise that the angel of the Lord has given him and just jumps straight into, but if God was, if God was, if God was here, if he was, if he was really with us, this wouldn't have happened. Why is this happening? This just sounds so familiar. I found myself um, in December asking the same question. Now I'm, I'm one of the fortunate ones that, so I had COVID in December and it was over Christmas time and um, you guys know me, I love Christmas and just everything that goes with it and spending time with family and I, we had holiday plans and lockdown ugh, and COVID and I was tested positive for COVID. And the first thing that comes to mind is why? Lord, why is this happening? Why me? What about my plans? We had, I was going on holiday and now I have to self-isolate away from my wife over Christmas. Lord, surely you're not with us. And in this, I've, I've just, in this, I've just realized that, friends, you and I, we will always struggle to see God in our circumstances if we ask the question, why? First. You see, Gideon asks why, when, what, but he never asks who. Friends, and I believe this is a question that you and I should ask way more frequently. Lord, who are you? Who are you? Friends, so it's not... You and I shouldn't go looking for the why, but we should find the who. We should find him, find Jesus in every situation because he is there. And when we find him, he will share with us the why, the what, the when, and the how. But our most crucial question is, who are you, God, in every situation? Church, oftentimes we don't get an answer to the what, we don't get an answer to the why. But what God offers us in difficult circumstances is so much greater. He offers His presence. The Lord is with you. Therefore, God's answer to discouragement is not positive thinking, but rather the promise of His presence. So wherever you are tonight, whether you've had a good holiday, a bad holiday, whether you have started the year like you wanted or you haven't, whatever circumstance you're in, can I ask you, to ask, who are you, God? Who are you, God? And let him reveal himself to you first and receive his presence. Verse 14. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? I love how consistently through the Bible, when individuals had found themselves at, at places where it's like, Lord, it's really going bad. Why aren't you helping me? What's going on? Every time this happens, we find this very consistently that God says, go. The answer to getting yourself out of a difficult situation is go. Go on my mission. Share the gospel. Advance my kingdom. Fulfill your calling. Fulfill your purpose. Don't be afraid. 
I just love it how the missional part of God's heart is just shown to us here. He says, I'm not going to, yes, the Midianites are there, but I want you to go. Have I not sent you? Am I not with you? Hudson Taylor, a famous missionary, has the following quote. He says, all of God's great men have been weak men who did great things for God because they counted on him being with them. They counted on his faithfulness. Matthew 28, we find the Great Commission, and that's exactly what Jesus promised. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And right at the, at the end, Jesus reminds us, says, but I am with you until the end of the very age. How incredible is it, friends, for you and I to move out of our situations. We just have to keep going, keep trusting, keep depending and counting on God's faithfulness. Verse 15, and he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you. But I will be with you. And you shall strike the Midianites as one man. So Gideon comes up with a new list of excuses. A new, he disqualifies himself. He actually over-exaggerates as well some of the details on his life. But there's just more excuses. But God answers the excuses in just such a loving way. He says, but I'm with you. This is the second time God promises his presence to Gideon. Hatfield, friends, family, what excuse will you and I use in 2021? What excuse will we use to not do what God's called us to do? Not to fulfill his purposes, not to advance his kingdom, not to say yes to the calling, not to obey him. What excuses will we use not to live holy and pure lives before him? What excuses will we use not to make disciples? Here's the list of them and they're all from the Bible. What about, I'm not qualified. Or I'm, I'm, I'm no one, I'm unknown, no one knows me. I can't speak well. I'm not credible. I'm too young. I don't want to, I'm not really list for this, Lord. I'm too scared. It's too, it's too scary, Lord. It's too risky. I'm too tired, Lord. I've been through too much. I'm too tired. Friends, these are all the excuses that we see just from the Bible. And I'm sure you and I can add multiple more to that list. But I love it how God responds to these excuses because this is so profound. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And every time there's an excuse, God promises his presence with us as we find right here. But I am with you, friends. We have more than what we ever could ask for. The presence of God is with us. Therefore, anything that he's called us to, he will fulfill it because he is faithful. So what happens next is Gideon then asked the angel of the Lord, okay, but if this is really so, I need you to give me a sign. Give me a sign, then I'll know this is really God speaking to me. I can just hear myself actually in that, how quickly we do that as well. But so he asked the angel of the Lord, all right, give me a sign that I know this is really God, but while you're doing that, I'm going to go and prepare a meal. I'm going to go and prepare a sacrifice. So you just wait here and I'm going to go. So I don't know if Gideon was doing this to try and test the angel. So it's like, okay, maybe, you know, he'll leave in 10 minutes and he's going to be bored. But the angel waits. The angel waits for him to return. So Gideon goes, he prepares a goat and makes a lot of bread. Um, and he brings it out. And the angel of the Lord says to him, okay, take the meat and take the bread and take the gravy and put it there on the rock. Um, and Gideon does it. And the next moment, something amazing happens. The angel doesn't go and eat on it. No, the whole meal bursts into flames. The whole meal bursts into flames. Verse 21 says, And a fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Can you just imagine that? A whole goat, a lot of bread, just vanish, just burst into flames. And just like that, the angel of the Lord disappears. And for the first time, Gideon realizes what's happening. For the first time, he there's like this moment of shock and awe that comes over him. Verse 22 says the following. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of God. And Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. 
Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. To this day it stands at opera, which belongs to the Abyssalites. Gideon realizes that he's actually dealing with God. He's actually dealing with God and the next thing hits him, fear. The fear of God overwhelms him. See, Gideon's response mirrors other similar instances in the Bible where, where people saw God face to face and they feared for their lives. He must have really believed when Moses said that no one sees God's face, no one that has seen God's face can live. So in this moment, Gideon is confronted with the fear of God. Oh no, I'm about to die. And it's amazing how the fear of God all of a sudden just blocks out everything that's happening around him. All of a sudden, this pressing matter of him being oppressed and the Midianites taking control and he's not good enough and he's not worthy enough and he's, all of a sudden, all these things just disappear. Even if it's just for a moment, it catches up to him later in the story, but just for the moment, the fear of God is central in his life. On the surface, it seems that the pressing issue that Gideon is facing is everything that's happening in his nation. Friends, where are you and I today? Are we so fearful and worried about everything that's happening in our nation? Everything that's happening around the world. I constantly hear people how people say how bad it is and the world's going, you know, and then we've got this conspiracy and this this idea and this theory and the whole world's burning down and and it's just these problems and this all just cause fear and anxiety. That's exactly where Gideon was. And then he just looked at his shortcomings, his own shortcomings. But in a moment. It is eclipsed by a greater crisis that he's just spoken to God face to face. What is the difference between when we respond of the fears around us and the anxiety and the worries? What does that produce in our lives? Well, more worries, more stress, more anxiety. But when you and I come face to face with God and realize that he is actually the one in charge, he is the most important, he is our deepest desire and our greatest need. What does God do in that moment? What does he offer us? He offers us peace. He offers us peace. Gideon had been living in fear for so long. He'd been hiding, probably living in a cave, not much going on in his life. He would, I mean, the Midianites had been ruling for seven years already, so seven years of fear and terror in his life. A lot of us are living like that today. Fear of COVID, fear of the unknown, fear of our plans are working out, fear of economic issues, and there's just a lot of fear. But God offers Gideon peace. That is the God we serve. That in the midst of everything that's happening around, he just wants that face-to-face moment and says, hey, recognize me, see me, because I want to give you peace. Jehovah Shalom. What does Shalom really mean? Well, Shalom is, not, is so much more than peace. Our English word just has one word for it, but Shalom is actually the... The collective that actually means completeness, wholeness, peace, health, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, fullness, rest, and harmony. That is shalom, friends. That is what our God offers us. The inward shalom, the inward peace that God gives us quiets out the the external fears. Philippians 4 verse 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, are we receiving this peace? And, 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 and here's the beautiful thing. That is not just something it's just intangible. No, friends, Jesus is our Prince of Peace. Jesus is the peace that you and I need desperately every day in our lives. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, you and I don't have to go looking for signs. We don't have to, we don't have to go looking for signs. Why? Because the Word of God already says that Jesus is our peace. It's been demonstrated. He's already poured Himself out for you and I. So what do we do in seasons like this? We grab onto Him. We fellowship with Him. We invite Him into our lives. Not only does Jesus offer peace, but He is peace. And that's something you and I have to grab on as we start this year 
this year of the unknown that we grab onto that. I don't know who said the following quote, but I just really thought it was profound, so I'm going to share it with you. Sometimes the Lord calms the storm, but sometimes He lets the storm rage and calms His child. We don't know how long lockdown and COVID is going to be around. We don't know how long the economic pressure is going to be around, the political tension is going to be around. We don't know that. But just maybe, just maybe, friends, those storms will keep raging, but God has an appointment with you and He's an appointment with me. And He wants to calm us so that when we step into the storms outside, we look different, sound different. We are people of hope. We are people of light. And we can point people where they can find everlasting life. When we, like Gideon, find ourselves doubting God's promises or His presence, all we can do is go back to Jesus and say, Lord, I believe you. Help me with my unbelief. Help me with my unbelief. I choose to believe today. I choose to believe, but just help me with my unbelief. Friends, that's how you and I can practically see the peace of God manifest in our lives. By choosing to believe. So what changed for Gideon? How did he go from the coward to the champion? He had an encounter with Jehovah Shalom. He had an encounter with a God of peace. Friends, and that's what I want to pray for us tonight, that you and I, at the start of this year, yes, things have worked out different than we had planned, but that you and I will have an encounter with Jehovah Shalom and know that He is our peace through all the storms we will face. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for being here, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that in 2021, you still have a plan and a purpose and an appointment with each one of us. Lord, you, you know exactly what everyone's been through the last three months, six months, last year. You know everyone by name. Lord, and therefore I ask Lord, those that are just caught up in the turmoil of what's happening on social media, on world news, or just around the corner. Lord, that you will have an encounter with them tonight. May they experience your peace. But Lord, I also pray that they will choose you. They will welcome you, Jesus, as the Prince of Peace in their lives. Lord, thank you that this is what you offer us. Every time Gideon failed or said the wrong thing, you didn't rebuke him. No, you promised your presence and you promised your peace. Thank you, Lord, that that is the God we serve, our awesome God. I praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, God promises us his presence and he promises us his peace. May we grab onto that and live this, this year full of faith. God bless.